Okay, guys, welcome to another edition of the Detour. I'm joined, as always, by four-time National Road Race champion, Johnny Trevorrow. Johnny, we say it every episode, but we've got another special episode, given that for the last two weeks, we've had all these comments and opinions on how the sport should be run, but when we break it down, we really don't know what we're talking about, do we? <laughs> well, you don't, but I do. Well, you think you do. You've got some good opinions. But I thought it'd be better if we actually got someone on that, that has got a bit more experience and a, and a bit more knowledge on these areas, Ify. Good idea. Taught her everything she knows. Oh, that's a big call. We're, we're speaking of Tracy Gaudry. Tracy, um, what is your official title at the moment? Because I got on your LinkedIn page and I still got a bit of a headache. I can't dissect it. You've got your finger in a few pies. Thank you. Yeah, Dad. And, and John taught me a few of the things that I know. And we'll, we, maybe we can dissect what John taught me and what I learned learn elsewhere during the during this session. Uh, but for the purpose of today's um, session, firstly, it's great to be on Detour. And um, uh, my official capacity is as a uh, lifelong cycling uh, participant and enthusiast. But in terms of formal roles, uh, I am uh, a member of the UCI Management Committee and uh, the president of the UCI Women's Commission and also the president of Oceana Cycling, which means we, we play a significant role, Oceana Cycling Confederation, in, in, in overseeing and promoting cycling in, in this part of the world, um, encouraging more cycling here to place more riders on the world stage and bring, uh, do, a lot, do as much as we can to bring as much cycling to these shores as possible. So there's a bit in there, Dan. Sometimes your head does hurt from the volume, but... Um, <laughs> You know, I think one of the mo one of one of the things that I'm sure John and I share and you do as well, Dan, is, um, uh, you know, this sport is in our DNA, and the more we can give back to the sport, and the more we can contribute to its success, the better. And that's that's what all these roles are about. Um, obviously, exactly the the, right. the biggest pending issue is this COVID nineteen outbreak, and you know, there's stories obviously with EF um, Jonathan Vorders coming out and saying, "Look, he advised that they stop the Giro on the next rest day." The, their riders have come out and said, "No, well, they're keen to race." Uh, there's issues with the bubble. Um, we'll, we'll kick things off uh, with the the current status at the Giro. Um, what are your thoughts on how the bubble's working and, and should the race continue in the current circumstances? Yeah, thanks, Dan. And and uh, when you think about the work we have as UCI, uh, we, you know, we govern over the sport of cycling. Our role is to make sure that uh, the, um, the, the combination of governance, the organisers, the teams, the riders, and then the local regions who are responsible for the how the race is managed through, you know, start, duration and finish of each stage. For us, um, the most important thing is the safety protocols in the race and around the race are upheld. And um, that's the responsibility of the Giro to work on with the local organisers and the teams. So whilst everyone is abiding by the protocols, we're good. Um, and I think, you, as you understand, if anyone, any part of the system says, you know, we don't need to apply that stringency, that's when things can go wrong. Um, but what we also want to recognise is the teams and the riders have a lot to race for. Um, they're salvaging a season that we've done, you know, collectively a great job in keeping going. Um, there are only a few races left in the season and everyone's working very, very hard in an increasingly COVID risky environment to keep the race going all the way through to Milan. So we're doing the very best we can. Iffy? Well, uh, yeah, I want a couple of things. Firstly, uh, before we get into all of that, I just wanted to let our uh, many listeners and viewers know a, a bit about uh, the background of, of Tracy. And I, as I mentioned, I jokingly said I taught her everything uh, I, I know, which isn't much. But um, <laughs> in the early days when I had a bike shop and I moved down to Geelong, uh, um, Tracy was just a youngster coming into the sport and she used to work a little bit part-time for me in the bike shop and help me out more than anything. But, um, you know, she was also an elite uh, uh, women's cyclist. She competed in the Olympics in 96 and 2000, Commonwealth Games in 98, uh, Australian national champion in that time. And she was also, at the height of her career, ranked number three in the world. So, you know, Tracy knows what she's talking about from a competitor's point of view and now with her long history, and she was vice president of the UCI just a couple of years back uh, as well. So uh, very involved in all of the running uh, of the UCI at men's and women's level. So we'll go there. And over the last 
week. I know that we've been looking at the whole COVID situation since the you know two teams had to leave and all of that, and we've probably been a little bit uh, hard on uh, the the duo in, in I have in my thoughts. But I've looked back over the last twenty four hours and looked at all of the emails coming back and forth, and I'm starting to realise that the sport is trying its hardest to get this right because the sport needs these races to continue but it can't be done at the detriment of the health of the not just the, the riders in our bubble of the public either and what i really like is the way it's turning around is the way that the the, the, the welter now is setting these limits they're really encouraging as is the, the tour of flanders which is on tomorrow mm -hmm. the, the people to stay at home watch it on telly don't come there. If it's coming through your town, stay on the side of the road, watch them go by, but not encouraging people to come from other towns to mix with the people in that town. So the latest messaging is very, very good. And if that can be really adhered to, then it can, it can continue. But it's all going to depend on how, the, you know, they're doing a lot more testing, what's going to happen with the final results that come out in a couple of hours' time for all the testing that they've done in the last couple of days. But I can see a real positive side to it. I just wanted to get that in because we've been a bit negative over the last couple of days. Yeah, well, it's good you fessed up to that, John. You're negative <laughs> most of the time. Um, but, uh, Tracy, is one of the biggest issues from when we chatted to Matt White is – the uncontrollables in that you're relying on the general public and you're relying on staff at hotels and so forth to do the right thing that don't fall under the onus of this racing bubble where they're drilled in. These are the right things and these are the right protocols. Is that the biggest issue you think that is currently faced by the teams? That's one of the major issues uh, in Europe. And, you know, I, I'm assuming most of the audience for uh, Detour is an Australian audience. And, as you know, we're we're operating in an environment where there are very, very firm restrictions. I'm living in Melbourne right now, uh, and so we're currently in a five-kilometre bubble and, and, you know, what you can and can't do is quite clear. Um, in Europe, uh, from region to region, there are different restrictions uh, from country to country, and there is not the same level of uh, formalised uh, policed or enforced restriction in the community as there is in Australia. So that is a significant risk if uh, if riders are operating in a bubble, but the extent of their bubble isn't so enforced. And that's an important thing is the teams will do the best they can. The riders clearly know not only is their health at stake, but um, their family's health and the rest of the community. But, but importantly, and, and, and John, an important element is the reputation of the sport. Um, the sport needs to continue. Uh, however, the sport also must show its social conscience and show that it's it's playing its role as a member of the community. Uh, so Dan, it comes back to um, as we met, as I mentioned at the outset, there is the UCI, there's the organisers, there's the teams, there's the riders, but there's also the role of the communities and the local regions in their message. And so John, that's exactly right. How do we ensure that every member of that community, whether they're a hotelier or a cafe or a, um, a member of the community, what's their role to play in keeping the race alive? Is, is there set protocols that are laid out? Because it sounds like there's different processes with RCS and ASO, particularly from when the riders finish the stage to getting to the team buses. ASO have a very, uh, it's roped off its corridor. There's no access for fans, whereas our RCS has different protocols where fans are getting very close to the riders and so forth. Is there a set protocol that is mapped out by the UCI or, or that's consistent across the board or is it up to the race organisers with sort of grey areas like that? Yeah. The, the protocols that we set in terms of bubbles and, and for those who've got a more scientific mind, a Venn diagram where there can be an overlap of different group bubbles such as teams and riders with media, for example, or with the race organisation um, depend very much on the environment in that community. So for example, um, if you're looking at uh, what, was what was happening in the Tour de France, um, and then uh, you could see the difference between the stages, the mountain stages and the final stage in Paris. And um, then, then when we saw the Road World Championships, which uh, John, when you're talking about what cycling's doing, you know, the, cancel the unfortunate cancellation of the Road World Championships in Switzerland, but enabled, but for UCI to work with Italy for them to take place, 
the protocols were so strict in terms of interaction. Then when you've got um, the, the Giro, we're reliant on the local regions and their protocols and, the, and then how the race organiser um, applies the local region's restrictions to the race. So, Dan, that's where the differences lie in terms of the local region and what the race needs to do. Mm. It's, tricky. it's very tricky um, yep. how we or the, the, the separation of the different parts of the race from the, from the community. Yep. I, I, I hear that um, the, uh, the, the Giro has implemented some stricter rules at the finish areas now so that what you were just talking about, Dan, isn't happening anymore. There is The riders do get a, a free go to their buses without any fans getting involved. And I noticed that they stepped up the testing you know, cons considerably in the last few days. So they, everyone's understanding that this is it, it, it's a moving uh, um, problem, and 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 it's this terrible virus is just so uh, demanding, and and so no one really understands it completely. So they 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 really are stepping up. There's no doubt about that. There well, is. Uh, sorry, sorry, Dan. You're right, you're uh, right Tracy. The other thing where I think you know the other thing that you know it's not just cycling facing, but the that the countries and governments are facing is as you said, John. You know the virus is um, you know we're dealing with change every day. We're dealing in Europe with growing cases every day. You know more than a hundred thousand cases across Europe in a given day, and so we're dealing with an evolving uh, virus going into you know we, we're in autumn going into winter time. So as you as as the Giro has been taking place, you know, two years in, two sorry, two weeks in, um, it feels like two years in terms of the effort each day. Uh, <laughs> two weeks in, every day you're dealing with a new set of circumstances, and that's why you see the organisers adapting each day, tightening the restrictions. And um, you know, as far as UCI is concerned, it's important that we make them as as tight as possible to enable the race to continue in a safe bubble. Um, we heard an interview with Caleb Ewan um, the other day, and at the end, uh, the interviewer was asking him, you know, are you going to head back to Australia at the end of the year? And he just flat out said, no, it's not a possibility with the forced quarantine. And the general vibe from the writers that we've spoken to is not many of them want to travel or can at, at travel at the end of the year. We're only three months away from the summer of cycling firing up in Australia. Is this going to be a big concern for races like Cadell's and Tour Down Under and, and so forth? Uh, Dan and, and John, you would have heard uh, Hataf and others talking in, in the recent weeks. It's a 24-7 it's a um, dialogue between the UCI, uh, the Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race, the Tour Down Under, at the, both the men's and women's races, uh, the state governments and the Australian government on what are the what's what are the requirements in order to have the race go ahead. Uh, that includes you know Australian quarantining and travel exemptions. Um, that includes uh, what's the state of play going to be in in South Australia come January. What's the state of play going to be in Victoria? Um, and uh, should teams um, be in a position to come into the country, what's the quarantine requirement, what's the bubble that they operate in, um, and then how can the race take place. So there is work going 24-7 uh, to provide, to ensure that the environment is safe for riders, but also uh, respects the community restrictions that are in place in the country. So that's live. Um, we can say that, that it's a 24-7 um, exercise uh, literally right now. And uh, as you know, we're three months away and you've just said, uh, yeah, less than three months away, I'm just looking at my calendar. Um, the, uh, the, 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 every day that goes by, there's a different set of circumstances. The challenge we have is uh, you'd like to have more time to be able to make the most informed real-time decisions about, about restrictions. But you also have the situation, as I'm sure uh, both of you and our viewers um, are, are very aware is that you know teams are making decisions about their early season calendar, and uh, there's that um, that tension between um, we need more time to make decisions about what's viable, but the teams also need to lock their calendars in as we're confirming riders, particularly the women's teams, 
Um, so we've, we're in the next, you know, in the next weeks are crucial for UCI, the organisers and the, uh, the local regions. I know that uh, if you had asked me two weeks ago, because I, you know, good much with Stu in, I've talked with him and he's always giving me an update on how he's going, talking with the teams and there was a real positive uh, feedback coming from the teams. And, and when I speak to the riders, different guys, you know, two weeks ago it was all of the Australian bus riders were looking forward to coming back to Australia where there isn't really a, a, a problem um, with the with the pandemic uh, and to, okay, put up with the with, with, with the um, quarantine situation. And it was a, but I'm getting the last, especially the last week when anyone spoke to, it's not the same positive feedback I'm getting. It's oh, going to two weeks of quarantine and then having to go into it when I go back. It all seems a bit too hard. I'm I'm getting a vibe that it's going to be a lot more difficult than what I thought. So, John, there's a couple of things there. One, the situation in Europe is has uh, declined in terms of uh, the the um, the impact of coronavirus there are more cases every day so there is a reawakening in europe of the impact of coronavirus and um, the corollary is uh you know we're living in australia which is uh, probably one of the safest countries in the world because of the restrictions that have been in place for what coming on seven months now would it be fair to say and um, so the 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 irony is that uh coming to australia is probably one of the safest places in the world to come to um, and going through two weeks of quarantine where, you know, the effort is how can a quarantine environment enable the riders to train in South Australia safely in their own bubbles, um, they're actually going to be in a really in safe, healthy hands. And one of the risks is on the way back to Europe, what are the quarantine restrictions that may or may not be in place by then? And I think, John, some of that nervousness is the nervousness about the unknown um, let's not forget that, you know, in uh, three weeks before the Road World Championships in Switzerland, um, it was cancelled and we were able to we were able to host the, real, the World Championships on the day in which it was scheduled in another country. Uh, so I think if there's, if there's um, anything to be said about the resolve of cycling and the stakeholders is where there's a will, there's a way. And, uh, you know, until, until there's no option left and we've exhausted all options, we're, we're, you know, we're gunning towards the Tour Down Under and the Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race, taking their place as the start of the, the World Tour season and the Women's World Tour season. Yeah, two parts. Firstly, the UCI and the Italian organisers have to be really commended for that World Championship, to put that on that quickly, and it was brilliant. Uh, really, really, really well done. Yeah, but the riders I'm speaking to, none of them are worrying about uh, the the uh, pandemic as far as uh, the contagious side of it coming to Australia. It is the quarantine and more the quarantine going back where they've been pretty well told that they're going to have a pretty good setup in Adelaide to let them go to quarantine and be able to train and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and be safe. But going back, it's not the same uh, guarantees going, and they're different countries with different rules, as you say. And to me, it's just putting a big question mark over the whole thing. The, the difficulty is, and and certainly we, you know, uh, UCI isn't isn't responsible. Can't you know cannot make the decisions on behalf of uh, the countries of origin for the riders on their return country. Um, that is an unknown. Um, and as you as you've seen in Europe, with races being cancelled and being able to go ahead. It comes down to the, the regulations and the restrictions in the country. So we acknowledge that that's a difficulty. Um, our, our, uh, our ability to maintain currency over those um, regulations is an important one. Um, we, we're, you know, in working with Tour Down Under and the Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race, I just want to also commend the spirit of collaboration between the two organisers and the two states. It's fantastic to see. Um, John, you're right, that is an issue because every day, um, what's happening in Europe and also America and other and other parts of the world, uh, we are um, dependent upon unknowns in January. Um, we can only hope that those those countries go into winter and the restrictions enable the caseload to go down, which means the quarantining process um, is going to be um, a manageable process for riders to come back to. Well, um, my last, my last one to throw at you. Sorry to jump in, uh, uh, Dan, but I'm used to it, mate. <laughs> uh, so, in the past, the the um, Tour Down Under is uh, being uh, 
you know, a world tour event, uh, the teams have to ride it. And, and not so much, even though Cadell's Race is a world tour event, it hasn't been um, mandatory. Is it still going to be mandatory from the UCI that, that teams ride Tour Down Under? I'm not, I'm not in a position to respond directly to that question. However, John, uh, you did write in that the Tour Down Under um, is one of the, um, before the expansion of the World Tour um, uh, five, five or so years ago is a mandatory event. And um, what I can say is that, is that UCI is working with the Tour Down Under and Cadell Evans race uh, to find every way to remove constraints for teams coming to Australia and uh, to remove, um, uh, to take what we call derogations is the, is the official term we use, is to enable a smooth passage for the event to take a hit, to take, to take place. We understand that for the economy of cycling around the world, the investment of, into cycling of uh, the local and regional governments, whether it be a country um, or whether it be a state like South Australia or Victoria, that um, to enable those events to go ahead um, ensures that those investments can re remain. So we're working with Tour Down Under as we speak on, um, and on all things in terms of teams, riders, quarantine, uh, mandatory participation, where they stay, um, how we would have safe passage from South Australia to Geelong, to Victoria and Geelong, as you know, um, and those decisions are being made on a daily basis. Um, geez, it's been doom and gloom a bit on this show so far, but we might as well just get it all out of the system. Um, worst case scenario, say it, it, it explodes in Europe. We had 31,000 cases in France two days ago, 12,000 in Spain. Say it looks like in a month's time, it's very, very unlikely that many, if any at all, teams would come out for down under. What's the latest, given how much logistics and planning goes into these events, that you have to make a call? Like, is that come from the UCI or will it have to come from the event itself? Um, and how much time? I know you said three weeks out from the Worlds, you could pre-plan and, and do another event. I mean, obviously, down under is a different kettle of fish. Yeah, Dan, and... and um it's you know it's it's pretty apparent to um, to the viewers and yourselves and us that um, for one thing to to be able to reposition the world championships uh, the way uh, we were able to um, was dependent on a number of circumstances. First and foremost, uh, the fact that. Um, most of the riders who would be in a position to be competing in the world championships, the elite riders, that, that I mean, uh, the elite men and women, were already based in Europe. Okay, so let's be honest that when you saw the world championships take place, uh, what, three, three and a half weeks ago, um, we we made a, made a call that to go ahead when uh, the, they were cancelled in Switzerland that in order to go ahead, it would only be feasible to stage the elite men and the elite women's races, that it would not be feasible to be staging under 23 and junior categories because most of those, particularly junior categories, would be national teams based in their own country and coming in. Yeah. So it stands to reason um, that uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, different and more complex proposition to start the season where a lot of the riders are based in uh, Europe, in their home country, um, to start the season in another continent. So um, then the reality is there are quite a few more hoops to jump through. Um, yep. the, the, the decision um, will come down to the intersection between uh, the, the, the latest date by which teams can, to, can get their calendar set um, and uh, the date by which the uh, Australia as a country, but also the states need to make that call. And as you would understand, uh, the ability for those two pieces to come together is is a day by day proposition over the next you know the next uh, next next weeks month literally. Yep. Um, shout out to Wendy Superfan. I stole that question from her. What's the latest uh, date to either go ahead or cancel races? I just <laughs> polished it up a bit. Hi, Wendy. Please uh, uh, being a super fan. 
Yeah. Um, now, Ian Thomas had a question. He said, Tracy, I hear that uh, Paula Carr has pulled the sponsorship from their women's team. Any info on this? Uh, there's no info I, I'm uh, able to give you at this point in time. What I can share is that the process for the women's world teams uh, for, for viewers is this year, um, ironically, was the first year and it's been a, a many years of build-up. So whilst we're talking about a lot of complexity at, at, the, at this year because of coronavirus, um, let's remember that over the past six to seven years, uh, UCI has been working closely with organisers and teams and riders to build a, a strengthened women's world calendar. This year um, uh, was the marking of the establishment of uh, the first ever year of women's truly professional teams, the women's world teams. We had eight women's world teams and then we had a, um, the second classification of women's UCI teams called women's continental teams. And we're at the process right now of receiving applications for next year's uh, to become world teams for next year or remain, um, as well as applications for continental teams. So at this point in time, we're working with teams on an individual basis on their capacity to uh, remain as world teams, step up to a world team or register as a continental team. And um, by the middle of November, we will be able to share um, the, the outcome of those negotiations and the team's applications. Is that one of the other big problems we've talked about it so many times on this show is the sustainability of teams in um, professional cycling and you add COVID to it, there's sponsors that just don't have the money, you know, and it's unlike most other sports where there's this history, there's this narrative, um, teams are folding and coming and going all the time. Is that one of the biggest challenges the sport's got moving forward is this sustainability with the model? Um, Dan, it's a really important conversation that we're having and if, if we were not experiencing, you know, seven months, eight months, nine months of coronavirus impact on the globe, um, we'd still be having this conversation, wouldn't we? We'd be looking at the sustainability of cycling as a global sport and as a commercially strong sport. Um, let's be honest, cycling is, is um, commercially um, not um, a powerhouse global sport such as um, football, you know, FIFA and other major sports. So we've got uh, a way to go and, and, and ironically um, this year cycling and UCI have been working on a women's model that builds much more sustainability in the system where there's collective input and collective return on investment. Coronavirus has thrown all that out of the window um, and so what we've needed to do is work very closely with teams on what's the minimum viable requirements for them to stay um, involved in the sport. And um, let's be, you know, let's let's just shout out to those investors in cycling. And and we've got um, our homegrown um, uh, one of the, the most significant, not only investors but commitment to the sport in Jerry Ryan uh, and his family. Um, we all know that we need to build stronger commercial viability. Um, we need to ensure that the viewership and the broadcast revenues are able to be part of the distribution of wealth through the sport and through that that will bring in more commercial sponsors that have a multi-year investment so those types of models are, are being worked on in, in in the background this year they haven't been able to be strengthened as much as we would like because of you know every day we're trying to keep the sport happening uh, let alone the growth that we had otherwise intended for this year and is the biggest challenge with that, if you were like the NBA or you were like F1 and all the big races fell under the one banner, so then you could do what they do and it's all on your mobile phone and you buy like a yearly pass and all that sort of stuff, yeah, that'd be ideal. But you're not dealing with that. You're dealing with a company called ASO who owned the biggest race that's 80% of the revenue. Uh, then you have to negotiate with them. Now, they probably don't want to play ball and this has been a long-running battle for 10, 15 years. I think the... The biggest hurdle, obviously, is is how do you sort of collectively come under one global banner, which is the sport that we all love, so that it benefits the sponsors, the fans, and it sort of has one more collective uh, vision. Hmm. There, there are many ways to establish um, sporting products, as you know, and uh, you know, in in many sports, and in Australia, we've got the you know we've got the AFL, um, you know, we've got league sports. Um, you know, in, in America, you've got the baseball league. 
And those those types of sport models are what we'd call a closed model where there is a set number of teams um, and they're within a system where there is a very there, there is a formalized commercial structure for the whole league. And cycling um, doesn't have that same structure. As you know, there's a there's a relegation and demotion system in place for world teams. Um, and teams can come in and go on a restricted basis. Um, and so when you've got different uh, a, a different product, we need to consider how we can commercialise that. And so, uh, you know, the World, the world Championship, the UCI owns, the World Tour, the UCI owns the, you know, the, 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 the brand of the World Tour. And so commercialising that product as the World Tour is an important element for us. Um, and how do we work with, existing organisers, as you said, the ASO has has ownership over a number of the events in the World Tour. And um, how do we how do we build a model that helps um, the pie get bigger and mm. so that distribution in the pie um, uh, benefits everybody in it? And that's a, an important piece. And that's why we're working quite closely with the, the Women's World Tour, which is newer and doesn't have the same type of established um, ownership and, and sharing. So it's about firstly creating a pie that can grow um, versus pulling it apart and rebuilding it because what we don't want to do as a sport is pull it apart to rebuild it. We actually want to create a model that can grow based on what we have already. It's great to hear you say uh, all of those things, Tracy, because it's so exactly it. With the, with the women's cycling, you've got a chance to build something from, from the ground up. Mm. And I'm sure, and what you're saying is exactly spot on in that – there is so much more money uh, available in the TV rights if it was a concerted joint effort from everyone, from uh, UCI, from RC, uh, RCS, ASO. If everyone was together in this and the pro teams, then there is there is so much more money available in the, in the whole television package. It has to become uh, a situation where these World Tour teams aren't reliant on sponsorship for 90% of their, their, their survival. Well, actually, nearly, it's 100%. Uh, so that, that's got to change. And it's got to be, you know, something like 50% of their costs have got to come from the from their media uh, assets. Things do need to change. And certainly this year has not helped the progress that, 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 we, um, that we in terms of all parts of the system uh, were intending for. However, when we look at the women's model by way of example, I'm sure on, on I'm sure on Detour there was a conversation several weeks ago around the women's Giro and it being uh, not awarded World Tour status next year. Um, one of the things that respect uh, um, I was putting my other hat on just for a moment, the UCI is doing, is that to strengthen the women's World Tour to have it as a commercially viable whole product of events is that a minimum standard is that every race must have live broadcast. So we're building the, the, the minimum standards to attract more sponsorship, to ensure that every race reaches the eyeballs of viewers around the world, which means commercially there's greater appetite for investing in the, in the sport and in women's cycling if, we, if, if those investors know it's going to reach more lounge rooms and more consumers of the products that they might be sponsoring through that platform. Um, Tracy, you've been involved with the UCI for quite some time now. Um, what are you most proud of uh, in the time that you've been there and the influence that you've had to create some of these changes? Um, thanks, Dan. The first thing I'd say is there's there's um, there's not one thing that anyone does on their own or can say it's proud of because I um, because I did this or they did that. It's the ability to um, uh, bring everything you've got to bear. Uh, to, to help build the case for change. And uh, for those who followed uh, my journey as a, as a rider, you know, John and based in Geelong and, you know, by the way, Geelong's such a great training ground for cycling and, and, and regional Australia, um, is the uh, ability to, um, to, to be at a table, at the table of UCI, and, and I was elected in... Uh, December, November 2012, we're going coming up eight years next month, the ability to, to, to be at the, the decision-making table of the UCI at a really critical time for the sport. We were going through a significant revolution 
participational crisis in the sport through um, th through the doping crises. Um, the sport was professionalising. Um, women's cycling, um, sadly, was going backwards in terms of the global reach and participation. Um, and it was the ability to be at, a ta at the table at the time when there was a lot of change required and to be able to um, uh, work with the management committee, have enough currency of knowledge of what was going on in the peloton. I'd been retired only a decade. Um, and to, to help um, improve the ethics of the sport, um, to help bring uh, gender diversity into the sport, um, and to help improve the governance of the sport. And, um, th you know, the viewers may not know this, but of, of all of the international federations, UCI is in the top half dozen federations in the world for its overall governance, which means it's good management, its um, role as a, as a corporate citizen for the sport and its contribution to the Olympic agenda. So we've now got you know, equal number of events, men and women in the in the Olympic Games. We've now got a women's world tour. We've now got a governance model, which um, uh, for viewers, for the first time next year when the continents have their election and the UCI has its election, there will be a gender quota in the election process. Um, and so we're in a position where um, cycling is now um, demonstrating that it's embracing gender equality, it's also embracing diversity. It's got a very strong code of ethics. And globally, we're reaching more parts of the world than, than we have ever before. We've got now 198 nations um, who are part of the UCI. And Oceania is one of those continents where we've, gone, gone, we've grown from four countries to 10 countries who are part of the membership of UCI in just eight years. So there's a bit there, Dan. We could go on for a while. Um, <laughs> Been a significant effort over over eight years, but um, my role is to help start has been help start those conversations about positive change. The rest is the collective effort of getting there. And congratulations for that yeah. uh, for that positive change. So I think this is a really good time. Let's talk about tomorrow. Tomorrow we've got the uh, Ronda von Vlanderen. Uh, Tour of Flanders, and one of the beautiful things that's happened this oh, year there we go. <laughs> is that exactly as you were talking about just then, Tracy, is that we've been watching uh, the women with their new with their classics now that you now with the Tour of Flanders. It was going to be uh, the Paris Bay, unfortunately, uh, they missed out in their first Paris Bay this year. But but it's wonderful that we've got you know Giro uh, de Lombardia, and all these wonderful classics that have been going for a long time in the men's. Suddenly, they're the classics for the women too because they uh, of the event that they are and, and tomorrow I'm really looking forward to it because we've got some Aussies who are going to be right in, in, in the mix there so uh, um, I think we can start on to the Ronda von Vlanderen, Tour of Flanders Ron Vlanderen a fantastic uh, race um, for, for any Aussies who've ever spent any, any time in Belgium uh, Australians and Belgians have a great relationship, we've got a similar culture, we're, we're, we're a little bit, have a bit more fun when life can be too serious um, but, uh, John and Dan, I have got the start list for both the men's and women's races here. Uh, we've also got the, the calendar for the World Tour for men and women. And sadly, there's been a few crossouts over the last weeks, hasn't there, in terms of, mm. um, you know, the, the amazing ability of UCI to work with the race organisers who originally had, they have all those World Tour classic races in the European springtime to be able to find a way to bring them back to life in autumn, the European autumn, you know, between August and October, only for half of them not to be able to take place because of the impacts of coronavirus and the country by country restrictions. But we've got Tour of Flanders tomorrow, Ron Blanderen, depending on which language you'd like to speak. Um, fantastic culture and a fantastic race. Are we talking women's first, John, or men? Which way? Yeah, yeah, no, no. Yeah. Number one, women first. Let's go women's first. Um, what a season it's been when you think of only been, uh, you know, half a dozen World Tour events, um, you know, starting off with um, when you think about um, uh, Classic in, in, in Spain, we weren't able to have Amstel Gold. Uh, we were able to have Liège. Uh, we were able to have um, Gent-Begulham. And uh, now we've got Flanders. 
I just want to call out before we go to who's my outright favourite. I reckon you're going to probably ask that question. I just want to call out for the Australian fans that it's going to be uh, one of uh, Gracie Elvin's very last professional races. Mm. And as an Australian rider who has had her whole career uh, with Mitchelton Scott, um, her whole professional career, um, if there's if there's any way um, uh, for her to go out on a high, it would be to win this race. She has um, she has placed very well in it years gone by. It suits her. Stress second, I think, didn't she? Yeah. Um, well, she's the only Australian female to be on the podium, John. Yep. You know that. Yep. I do that. <laughs> You're calling each other out now. It suits her style. Um, as you know, uh, she announced her retirement um, a bit over a week ago, um, and I would say um, she will be doing the very best she can, and the team would be glad to see her win. Um, I'd say on Mitchell and Scott's got one of the strongest teams in the race. On the race I just want to. I just want to. A shout out to Gracie, actually. Um, John mm. sent me a podcast uh, that I listened to um, on a walk this morning, and it was one of the most raw, honest interviews I think I've ever heard with a professional athlete. And it, Lauren Rowney uh, did the interview with a, an, another lady, I can't remember her name, but it was fantastic. You got to check it out. Um, do you remember the name of it, John? It's so the so, it's a, it's it a cycling staggering. tips yeah. one, but it was staggering. Yeah. And she just opened up about all the pressures that they mm. that she has as an athlete. Obviously, for the the women's tour, it, it it is very difficult given the you know financial situation for a lot of these riders that are on minimum wage and the sacrifices they have to make. And then she talked about you know the breakdown of of her marriage and was just open and honest about the the whole situation. I thought it was unbelievable. So chapeau to Gracie for, for that interview. It was fantastic. And while we're talking about Gracie, before you move on, I just to say, I was talking to Jerry Ryan just the other day and he and Gracie's name come up and he said he got the most beautiful letter uh, from Gracie and parts of that are actually on uh, the the uh, Green, Green East web, website. But, but a, a personal letter to Jerry, uh, he said it was beautiful and quite moving. So she, she's a special lady. She is. I'm just going to send one more, um, share one more um, accolade and well-deserved one about Gracie, um, is that not only has she been a, a, a wonderful um, uh, ambassador for the sport on the bike, uh, we, you know, by her honesty, Dan, as you've said, uh, she's sharing what it, what, it, what it means to be a professional athlete and it's, it's not easy. But she also has played a very significant role in the establishment of a women's riders um, uh, um, representation group called Australian, uh, not Australian, um, uh, Cyclist Alliance. And that group um, represents the interests of women professional riders. And she was one of the founding directors of that while she was racing. So she was a representative in the peloton. Um, that shows a lot of courage and it shows a lot of insight and also the ability to perform at your best whilst you're thinking about the well-being of others. That's that says something about about Gracie and I certainly uh, wish her all the well this all the best this weekend and in her final races. But she's she's going to have a lot of success in life off the bike because of her character. Oh yeah, for sure. She's really really switched on and articulate how she speaks. Um, yeah, that's great. And yeah. as you mentioned, Mitchelton Scott team is uh, has got so many uh, uh, avenues with, with, with uh, uh, Anamique, with Grace Brown being in in scintillating form, you know, second in Liège and uh, winning mm -hmm. the uh, Brabant Pale or however you say that one. Uh, and she so she's a big chance on this course. Uh, and of course, Spratty Amanda Spratt is back and uh, in form. So they've got a three or even four pronged attack. And then you've got Sarah Roy, who's doing re really, really well at this back end of the season as well. Well, actually, the shortened season—I shouldn't say back end because it wasn't a there wasn't a middle season. Um, so uh, I'd say Mitchell and Scott have got so many cards to play, and the course um, is really suitable for a whole team effort because it's one of those courses and one of those races where um, it's about the opportunist who can get away and, and win. Um, if there's a sprint finish, they've got options there. So Mitchell and Scott's going to be a team to watch. Let's also uh, look at um, some of the other season favourites who who just keep coming back time after time, obviously. Um, uh, Bulls Dolman, um, Van der Bregen, of course, 
um, Jolly and Dora. Amy Peters has played a really important role through the, through the shortened season. Um, and one of the other teams that, um, you know, I have a soft spot for um, in terms of Trek Segafredo, Lizzie Dagnan, who's come back after having her first child, but she's got Ellen Van Dyke and um, Longo Borghini on her team. Um, it's just such an amazing uh, field this year when you think about um, riders who are at the front end of their career. Um, you've got Pisa, um, Cassia Neodoma, you've got Lisa Brunel, you've got Cecilia Uthrop Ludwig, um, for those who are looking at accents, who is the, the life of the party in the bunch. Um, and guess what? Um, Marianne Voss, who continues to shine, uh, nice. multiple championship. Um, I remember in the early 2010s, 2013, 14, 15, she had a few quiet years and look, she's coming back again now. Um, uh, there's, you know, all of those riders could be on the podium uh, tomorrow night. Yeah, it's going to be a bloody good race, that's for sure. Mm. So and let's move right to the men's. You got the, the you got it all in front of you. We're going to have well, a, a, another amazing race in the men as well. Well, the the punters think it's down to two. Vanderpol and Walt Van Art. They're both three dollars twenty five favourites. Um, and then you know the rest is you pretty much throw a blanket well, over it. Well, 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 I reckon, I reckon Alain Philippe will win it. So there you go. All oh, right, he's eleven dollars, reckon- John. <laughs> yeah, I'd be putting your money on uh, uh, Ala Philippe. Unless he puts his hands he up too early. He throws his hands up, yeah. <laughs> or chops him in the sprint. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Walt Van Aert would be pretty hungry. Um, you know, he, he's just did an amazing uh, amazing role in, in at this stage in his in his road career. Um, let's not think, let's not lose sight of people like uh, Matteo Trenton, um, Seth Van Aert, Van Mark, um, Ella Philippe, I think, will be pretty hungry, but he's he's already had a win as a world champion, so that's interesting. Um, Mads Pedersen uh, would be up there, and great yeah, form, yep. Kodowski. So there's, you know, there's Bosenhagen. There's probably eight to ten who would be in that mix, and as you've seen in the last classics, uh, the favoured ones come to the front, and it's been a, an absolute tussle. And we we hope and expect it's going to be like that again tomorrow. So I just. Rest- just- I was Sorry, just going to say, are they, yeah. are they restricting, obviously, crowds uh, for Flanders? Because that was obviously, you know, what it was known for, all the Belgies up there on the beers and their flags out and stuff. Um, are they limiting all of that at this yeah. race? The messaging is all stay home, uh, watch from home, um, keep the race alive by staying home, keep everybody healthy by staying home. Um, I'll have to come take on notice what the exact uh, race um, a uh, the race restriction is around the the footprint of the race, uh, but certainly um, uh, keeping everybody away from the race is going to be the the safest way for the riders in the community, and we can expect that to be the case tomorrow. They made interestingly they made a decision because there's some slight changes to the course not to publicise the actual. Uh, route of the Tour of Flanders. They have kept it until the race starts because they don't want people to go out there. They've actually said that. Well, can I keep it quiet? If it's coming through your town, fine, stand there and watch it go past your town, but don't go drive anywhere to go and watch it. But while we're on that, you know, I know it's been a real struggle to get races on, but, gee, the racing has been brilliant. Tour de France, Giro, all the classics, Every day, we're just shaking our head with just how good the racing has been, men's and women's. It's been the best season of racing, actual racing, I've ever seen. Mm. It's been astounding. And and the irony um, is when you spread the races that we've had in the last uh, three months, and I'm looking at both of the World Tour calendars here, uh, you spread them across the whole season We've also had the situation where you've had, um, with you know the Giro going on at the moment, you've had the the one day classics in the envelope within that as well, and so it's required teams to decide which is the team for the classics and which is the team for the the three the three week stage races, and within each combination we've had that strong racing. It's almost like. Every single time, particularly the one-day races and the classics, every single time 
every rider and every team gets on that start line and races as if it's the last race they're going to race for the season. And that's what giving that extra energy to it is. We're going to treat this as the is our as our opportunity because we don't know when the next one's coming. And there is also that freshness as people are coming into an interesting part of form at the back end of the year when they're normally coming out of form because they're about to the close. So it's quite an interesting combination of how people have been able to build form quickly um, and to be able to, to basically going at 100% every time they put their foot on that start line. Exactly hey. right. And, you know, it, it's a bit like boys and kids in the lolly shop. By, by restricting them, by actually stopping them from racing for all that time, which has never, ever happened before, they've suddenly, oh, they realise how much they wanted to race. And once they got the OK, bang, they raced and they haven't stopped. On the flip side, you've got a lot of riders that are going, oh, it's bloody October. I'm over this. I should be on holidays. So it sort of goes both ways. But I've the always. The back. They're the ones I, out the back, mate. I've always said, Tracy, um, shorter stages in the Grand Tours. You know, these stages where it's 230, 240, keep them short. You should, UCI should bring in a rule 160K max. That's it. So it's on from the gun. John loves the traditional side of things. No, but, I've got to um, mix it up. No, they're doing that now, though. I mean, they're, they're shortening. I think the, the, the Giro's got a few more stages over 200 than the Tour de France. Tour de France did it spot on this year, and I think that's going to be the format. Every now and again, you can work a 220K in, but um, they've worked out that the stages around the 160, 170 kilometres are producing sensational racing. So, uh, And I think that's going to be the way it moves. And, and just one other thing, Tracy, you're talking about um, Gracie Elvins, uh, how she started the Riders' Union for the women. Um, there's been a lot of talk as well for the men's. Uh, they're trying to form this union as well. Sam Bewley's come on the show and gave us a bit of insight and the frustrations, I think, with the current setup where they want it like one rider, one vote. Um, what's the current status with all of that sort of stuff? Okay, thank you. So um, I'm going to go back to the length of the races in just a moment because that's a really, really interesting and exciting conversation. Um, within the, the the men's racing, there's there's the CPA, the Professional Cyclist Alliance, there's the, the Teams Union and then there's the, the organisation, organisers, um, group and they all come together to join the Professional Cycling Council with UCI, which makes decisions around the, the construct of the, the men's world tour and men's racing. Um, within women's racing, because uh, we've built the world tour and um, the uh, development of women's cycling is enabling uh, the system to consider what's the best way of supporting the interests of the riders, the teams and the organisers those um, representative groups are still forming. And so the, as you as we talked about, John, there's an opportunity with the burgeoning um, development of women's cycling to consider what's optimum versus what have we already got. And as you know, it's it's um, there's, there's, there's often seen to be more opportunity in building something new than breaking something apart and putting it back together. So with the men's peloton and professional men's cycling, um, it's appropriate at that point in time, um, the, the, the cohorts in cycling say, what's best for us? And so, you know, the conversation around what's the best model and makeup for the CPA, the Professional Cyclist Alliance, is a live conversation. What's the best way for the teams to be represented is an important conversation. What's the best way for the organisers to be represented is another important conversation. And so UCI can help facilitate those conversations However, we also need to allow and support each of those cohorts to make decisions about what's what's the smartest way for them to be represented in those collective discussions. So it's a live conversation. Um, we welcome those discussions because at the end of the day, every rider, going back to the riders, every rider needs to be confident, confident that they're being represented appropriately by the body that's acting on their behalf. Yep, I reckon Bules would be happy with that answer. <laughs> I think so. Yep, fantastic. Sure. So I reckon we have a little bit of a, a, a dabble into uh, the, the Giro, the last night's stage, and then uh, what's coming up tomorrow. What do you reckon, Dan? Yeah, why not? Ulysses, uh, he mopped them up. John, you did you predict? Who did you tip? I don't think you did. I don't think you tipped Ulysses. 
Now, I picked uh, DeMar. Uh, I thought he might have got back on, and it was a fantastic – it was an interesting bike race. So you had a break go early that never really got well established, and then the uh, the GC riders got involved. Bora put the pressure on because it was, it was dead pancake flat for three quarters of the bike race, and then two climbs, two cap fours near the end. On the first cap four, Bora put the pressure on, but DeMar was only just off the back, and he got back. On the second one um, – the GC riders took over, they caught the break, and Sagan got uh, spat out the back uh, himself. And so had DeMar behind Sagan, but they never ended up in the bike race. GC riders then went for it. And uh, Ulysse was the uh, only one with a bit of speed amongst all the GC guys, really. And so uh, even though Ulysse won it, um, the, the the pink jersey, uh, Yare, um Maida, or however you say it, we say his name, was was mm. brilliant. I, I only beat him by half a wheel, uh, and um, uh, fantastic. And uh, just back there in in tenth place, Joy Hindley, who was really stepping up. He's seventh overall now, and mm. uh, looking very very good. Young youngster who won the uh, Jacob Hurl Sun Tour last uh, last uh, January. And there's really not much to talk about the time trial. Let's be honest. Uh, you know, there's a, a few <laughs> bit of a lumps at the start. You know, there's a cat four, a bit lumpy towards the end. But if you look at the odds, I mean, Garner's going to mop this up. I mean, Rowan Dennis, he's uh, – if he has a good set of legs, Garner's obviously gone pretty deep in this Giro iffy, so that might come into account. And instead of winning by 10 minutes, he might win by five. So, he'll win but, it. He'll win it by, as I said in the uh, prologue. He'll get. He'll, no one will get within twenty seconds. No one will get within thirty seconds of him here. I don't think so. You nah. can put unless he has a puncture or something go wrong. Uh, I can't see anyone uh, beating him in this one. But but mm. watch that young uh, tour leader. He finished second in the in the prologue to Garner, and uh, he is in very good form. So uh, he would be the only one who could maybe up. You know, a bit like Tour de France, you know, what, what happened on that second last mm. uh, mountain. No one would have picked it. But yep. uh, I, I think uh, young Yoe uh, Almeida is looking more and more a real possibility to win this Giro. All right. Well, there you go. You've heard it. Um, Johnny, do you want to send a bit of a cheerio to Jerry's company, Mitchelton? Do you find it well? Does Jerry own that company, does he? I think he's got oh. a fair fingernail of it. <laughs> I'm gonna, well, okay. Well, I, I, I'm going to come out and say from the heart, I love the Mitchelton Winery, uh, the whole setup there. I do spend a bit of time up there. We've got my little cabin around the around the corner. Uh, but I, I just love going in there because it's just such a beautiful uh, uh, um, setup. You've, you've been there yourself, Tracy. You know how gorgeous it is. We used to, to run the the, the – uh, the ride there, which was Amy Gill, was, Federation was involved with for a little while while you were, were involved. But it, it is just such a glorious uh, place. And as I say, you can experience the history, the beauty and the serenity of the Goulburn Valley. I mean, it's become the in, the go-to place for, for, for weddings and special functions, birthdays and stuff. Because you sit out there on in on the gardens, overlooking the beautiful Goulburn River, and then go into the beautiful function rooms. It's, it's an amazing. That viewing platform, jump in the lift, go up to the top there. Down below, if you go to the, push the other button and go downstairs into the catacombs down below, there's the most amazing Aboriginal uh, art gallery, which is world-class. It is staggering. The hotel, as you see there, beautiful views out both sides, two levels, um, uh, go into the into the spa, quiet the mind, unwind the body, rediscover your balance in a setting of peace and harmony. So, and then if you, if that doesn't do it for you, duck into the cellar door and uh, get some beautiful Mitchelton uh, Heathcote Charade, which is my favourite, and book a wine tasting. It is a wonderful day. So go, you, when you go to Mitchelton Winery, Go there for the day. It is something special. Tell them John sent you. Uh, exactly. <laughs> uh, well, that won't do you much. Tell them Jerry sent you and you might do a bit better. <laughs> yeah. uh, quick word from our mates at Bike Exchange and then we'll wrap up. Look at this bike. You think it's just a bike, right? But it's not. <clears throat> it's a bike. 374 people are looking at. This guy, this girl, them, all looking at it. People from here, there, and wherever this is. People that are looking for a bike. 
or just a piece of it. Amateurs, semi-amateurs, and pro-amateurs. This guy wants this bike, but with this crank and these bars. This could be the perfect match, but not this one. This girl has a bike to sell, and thousands of people might purchase it. Eyes on Bikes help grow small businesses. His, hers, yours, and the latest data and insights help those businesses keep moving. We are the world's number one bike marketplace with over 500,000 products and 900 brands where buyers and sellers are brought together in a place where a bike is never just a bike. Bike Exchange, where the world buys, sells, learns and rides. Thanks to our mates at Bike Exchange. Love, love um, that just ad. Want to, <laughs> just want to say massive thanks, Tracy, for coming on the show. It's been uh, sensational because, as we said, we've had a lot of back and forth over the last couple of weeks, but most of the time we don't really know what we're talking about to get a proper insight on some of the issues that the sport are facing and uh, the, the stance with the UCI has been really, really good. So um, uh, really appreciate it. If we, what do you want to finish off with, mate? I just want to uh, thank uh, Tracy very much for coming on and just say that the roles are reversed now. I can't say that I've taught you everything because you're teaching me so much. So fantastic, Val. Very and I'm like a darling. Sorry about the doll. <laughs> Great to be one, guys. And, and certainly as, as hopefully for viewers, you know, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. And if there's one thing that this year has shown is the collective effort to keep the sport alive and, and thriving one of the few sports around the world has been able to host its major events in the world this year and that's a pretty amazing thing and we we, we actually thank uh particularly those who've continued to invest in the sport um the the riders for for staying focused all year dan you talked about riders being tired at the back end of the year a lot of that's the exhaustion of the unknown you know spending all, mm. all winter all summer training not knowing when they're going to start I, i'd say um, quietly, um, they'd all be pretty delighted that they've been able to race for even a few months this year, let alone not at all. And uh, I, I know they'll be looking forward to a break and let's hope that they can be starting again January uh, in Australia as as per the plan should be. Yeah, fingers crossed. And as we said, we really appreciate you coming on, Tracy. We'll get you back on another time and we'll just share fun stories and have a good laugh and uh, hopefully the, the doom and gloom all starts to clear up and uh, particularly with this COVID. Uh, if he... Just to let all the fans know that uh, it was great to hear some of those stories about Gracie Elvin. Uh, evidently her last race is going to be the what used to be the three days de, of De Pana, which is now a two-day race, I think, but it's still called that. But uh, that's going to be her final race and then we're going to get her on uh, to, to talk about uh, her amazing and wonderful career. Perfect. I'm well, looking forward to that. That's only a couple of days after uh, the Flanders, so it's on the 20th of October is her very last oh. race. Oh. Uh, I can't wait to hear that story. And um, she she will be self-effacing and then she'll be sending praises to everybody else. But I think if uh, viewers want to tune in, that's a site from, that's going to be a voice from inside the peloton of the last six to eight years. It's going to be an invaluable, uh, valuable story. Well, yeah, I'll definitely. give you a couple of days' notice because you know how I always prepare you for these things well in advance, Tracy. Um, but we'd love you to uh, jump on board and be uh, uh, and have a uh, play a part in that because it's going to be a wonderful night. Absolutely love to. And I've noticed since she was a young teenager uh, riding a mountain bike actually in Canberra saying, what should I do with my life? I'll stay on the bike. And, um, you know, the rest is history. She made it all happen herself but with a lot of a lot of help along the way and she'll be sending a lot of acknowledgements. So... It'll be a lot of fun. Oh, awesome. Looking forward to it. Johnny, you'll have to tell Dave Brailsford that don't worry about that night. We'll clear it out for uh, Gracie. <laughs> yeah. I, what, what about uh, Luke Rowe? Uh, uh, do, how's he going? Have you seen? Uh, 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 no. Nah, no, he's, he's still just sent to a phone. Oh, okay. still asleep, mate. So okay. Luke Rowe, yeah, okay. we'll, we'll wake him up and we'll get him on the next couple of days. <laughs> Thanks again, Tracy. We'll be back at normal time tomorrow night because footy finals aren't on, 7.30. Uh, straight east is standard time. And Johnny will no doubt line up a super guest. So we'll see you then.